So I would like just to welcome everyone. Um, my name is Tessa Hobbs Curley, and I am a family life educator with the University of Illinois Extension. And this is our summer self care series. This series is a collaboration between Illinois Extension and the Interdisciplinary Health Sciences Institute at the University of Illinois and is designed to connect those across the state with researchers at the university and provide evidence-based educational programming. And this is recorded, so we're asking that you turn off your videos. And if you have any questions during the program, please type them in the chat box. If you're calling in, please hold your questions until the end of the session. Now, without any further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker for this series, and his name is Jonathan Cerna. Jonathan received a Bachelor's of Science in Dietetics with a minor in Exercise Science from Iowa State University in 2018. He is currently a MS student in the Body Composition and Nutritional Neuroscience Lab, where his primary research investigates the modularity effects of the carotenoids pigments found in plants and animal sources in people with multiple cirrhosis. Today, he'll be talking to you about making your habits stick. Welcome, Jonathan. All right, thank you, Tessa. Thank you for that introduction. Hello, everyone. Again, as Tessa said, my name is Jonathan Serna. It is really my privilege to present on the topic of habits um, to everyone today. This is going to be a very practical presentation that will help you to put into action everything that you've been learning about throughout this entire series and help you to put into action everything that um, is to come in the um, upcoming presentations. So let's get started. So just a little bit of information on who I am. Um, I was born here in the United States in Orlando, Florida, but I will always refer to Panama as uh, my hometown because I was raised in Panama. Um, here to the right, we have a picture of it in case you don't exactly know where it is. It's between Costa Rica and Colombia. And uh, as Tessa mentioned at the beginning, I got my bachelor's degree in Iowa, at Iowa State University in dietetics and I minor in exercise science. I'm a second year student in the nutritional sciences and I study the effects of carotenoids, which are essentially plant pigments, also found in some animal-derived um, sources, and their effects on people with multiple sclerosis. So that's just some background on myself. And first up, I want to start by giving a personal note on the topic of behavior change. This is anecdotal, and um, I know that we, I am going to be referring a lot to the literature, but I want to make a personal statement that I have engaged in one way or another with basically all the recommendations that I'm gonna be talking about. With all, I've made many of the mistakes that uh, many people have made, but I've engaged and tried to apply many of the solutions. And this is in line with the presentation today because it's gonna be very, very practical. Um, again, this information here is not new at all. I'm just aggregating it, aggregating it for you, putting it into practical application with topics that are very in vogue nowadays. And just a disclaimer, because I am not a psychologist, a therapist, or a dietitian yet, um, but this would be the people that you would normally talk about for, um, very, for behavior change and many of the topics that we're gonna cover today. And although each one of the things that I will present, each slide could be a talk in and of itself, again, I will summarize it in a way that is very practical, It'll be focused on just the relevant background information and everything from there will be very practical and applicable. Ultimately, if you are looking to make very drastic changes that will impact your health, um, you should consult with your physician at the end of the day. And uh, that is just a disclaimer again to start the presentation. I just wanted to put that out there. Um, some learning objectives for today. Um, this three main points summarize everything that we're going to be talking about. We're going to be defining habits and we're going to recognize their and potential impact. We are going to understand habit formation and we're going to talk about the most common misconceptions around it and how they impact our perception about behavior change. And then we're going to discuss strategies 
sustainable strategies to incorporate to either start or stop a habit as they pertain specifically to the topics of exercise, diet, and meditation. So first, if everyone could help me out a little bit and tell me a habit that you've been able to successfully adopt. So if you could put that in, your, in the chat, I'll give you a minute, a minute or so so that you can tell me, but I'm interested. Oh, wow. Okay. We're getting a lot. Okay. It's coming in. The yeah, exercise, drinking water, going to bed early, a ton of things. This is great. Getting more sleep, mindfulness, smaller portions. Yeah. All these things definitely are incredibly important for sure. But it was actually kind of a trick question because I know that we often think of big routinary habits that we want to incorporate on a daily basis but it really starts with something as simple as like turning the light on or just being able to brush your teeth. So let's just first go into the definition of habits because one of the trickiest, trickiest things about habits is that everyone has their own definition. And the definition really does matter. They frame the way we think about concepts. They can, be, they can determine how complex or easy a concept is. And they can also paint a more or less complete picture. So just reading up here, according to the Oxford Dictionary, habits are a set or a settled or regular tendency or practice, especially one that is hard to give up and an automatic reaction to a specific situation. But a more updated, although informal definition, one more in line with the evidence is a recurring solution to, recur to a recurring problem. So I wanna give an example here that we might not really think of frequently that is a habit that we for sure have it by now, but it is a habit, is turn the light on. It, it helps to make the point about how behaviors get adopted. So if you're, if you're thinking of the simple habit of just turning the light on, you recurrently get to your house and you encounter a problem, the light is off, to which your brain has a heuristic, a shortcut, an immediate action associated not only with your motor response of looking for the switch, but even knowing where it is with a high degree of precision and knowing the exact position in which it needs to be, et cetera, et cetera. So from this outcome, your brain perceives either a reward or a punishment. So if the, if the room needs some more brightness, you get a reward uh, for, turn for turning the light on. But if the room is already lit, then you get what you call a punishment or simply the lack of reward, which might make the actual behavior in and of itself to degrade later on, but then, it also gets associated with what first caused the outcome to occur. So here you see just um, a, a, a cue and an outcome, a reward, all just associated by the process of sheer repetition. And I want to talk a little bit about what this might mean at the bigger level, at the big impact level. And first, I want to start with a negative case study. So how this impacted. Um, people negatively and the perfect example to me was uh, something that happened happened in the Vietnam War in 1971 alarming rates of addiction were reported during, during the Vietnam War and during the second period in Vietnam actually up to 47 percent of soldiers were addicted to heroin but thinking of this specifically in terms of habits we can think that the GIs were sitting there and then they were trying to recover from this traumatic event that happened or simply dealing with boredom and it happened to be the case that their coping mechanism involved engaging with a substance that temporarily caused an uplift, like an emotional uplift, and unfortunately came with a really hard come down. But in terms of habits, we can see that they started associating their um, new uplifted emotional state with the substance that they consumed. But not only this, but from the other side as well, they saw that their either state of boredom or of um, excessive arousal was either toned down or uplifted a bit more to, in, a, in a sense that they liked it to the substance. But unfortunately, in the cases of substance abuse, since they have such a hard calm down, they were at the end of the day either feeling worse or at least they came back to baseline, which wasn't really pleasurable, which 
uh, left the gap open for them to come back again to their substance, which was their coping mechanism. This is in line with what the literature has shown regarding addiction, which many times is defined as continued use, despite adverse consequences. But it, this is also a good case study because these people came home and although a huge problem was forecasted, nine out of 10 GIs were not consuming and not abusing any substance at all. And it just highlights the importance of how environment cues behavior. And I wanted everyone to put a pin on that because I'm gonna come back to that later. But now I wanna to turn to a positive case study. And in this, in this case, I wanna to turn to one of the blue zones. Um, people might have heard about this, but there are several zones around the world where, which um, are known for having a really long longevity. And they include people from Loma Linda, California, the um, Seven Day Adventists from there. Um, there are also people in Greece, people in Costa Rica, but right now I wanna talk about the Okinawans in Japan. And they are part of a system that really values physical and mental habits that help them to live a long and healthy and vibrant life. And in the case of habits here, you can see how it positively impact them. Because say they have a, again, neutral emotional state or a slightly post positive emotional state, and then they just go on to engage in their daily habits, which happens to have this well-structured, this um, like, really well-built emotional, social, financial, um, just complete wellness picture of how to support their habits, which leads, we know socially and psychological to a positive emotional state, but fortunately it leads to many byproducts of engaging in these habits, which are many time, um, you know, cardiovascular benefits, cognitive benefits, which we know are associated with engaging in these habits. And again, this just causes the reoccurrence because they are intrinsically pleasurable to complete because they're reoccurrence. And since we know that they are also going from either a neutral or slightly positive state to a better one at the end because of their outcome, they start just associating each one of these outcomes with their habits, including nowadays because we have repeatedly told them that these things are positive, even their, their private products themselves are considered and framed as something positive. But they are a very interesting uh, population to study because nowadays um, one of their aspects of wellness has been taken away slightly or just modified because they become increasingly westernized. Their diet specifically has become increasingly westernized. And here we can see a direct link uh, between one of their wellness categories being affected and one of their byproducts going away because their cardiovascular benefits and cognitive benefits have been seen to come down, instead of being like higher longevity, lower rates of cardiovascular disease, they have come down to the national average. So this, again, links this, um, the, involve, the enrollment of these habits leads to these byproducts, and upon the removal, they are also removed. And now um, I wanna turn to habit formation in and of itself. And this um, is not exactly in line, so I'm just gonna put it here for you um, so that we get a complete picture all at once. Um, here up here is the, um, the circle that Charles Duhigg outlined in his book, The Power of Habit. It essentially states what the literature has shown repeatedly to be what sets up the, the, a routine, which involves a trigger or a cue, a routine or a behavior, and a reward of a punishment. But here I want to talk about how a routine gets made in and of itself. And a neural process that is very important for this is called chunking, which is actually the cognitive process of, of stringing individual events into a smooth, automatic behavioral sequence. So I wanted to, this to go one by one so you could think of just uh, riding a bike and at the beginning how sloppy it was. You were just looking at the floor, looking at yourself, trying to gauge your balance, and you were stringing a piece each, like piece by piece, but upon you know, leaving the behavior, going and sleeping on it, and then coming back to it, it occurs more smoothly. It, fit, it fits with the anecdotes of how what people talk about when they're starting to drive and they barely got it, they're thinking a lot about it, and then they come back to it after like repeatedly engaging in it and it occurs smoothly. But neurally, this is really 
Um, interesting. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, physio neurophysiological uh, underpinning of this because it is highly related to the do dopaminergic system. Here, dopamine, um, just so that we understand the context, it is essential for the feeling of reward so that we can feel that completing the task in and of itself is intrinsically rewarding. It is also essential for us to learn the behavior and it is essential for that behavior to reoccur. And neurally, this has, this, be, this has been studied with fMRI studies and we've seen a shift in um, processes used from the active thinking frontal lobes to the sensory motor and subconscious systems of the brain, which, as I mentioned before, totally fit, it fits in with the anecdotes of, you know, just sloppily stringing it together to it then therefore become subconscious, smooth, just, um, what do they call it? Like um, the learned motor response or muscle memory. So all that really just shows how the neural underpinnings really do fit with the anecdotes. And now I wanted to talk a little bit about some common misconceptions of behavioral change because they many times create more barriers than are needed in order for us to adopt the behavior. And you might have heard this. It goes like, uh, if you do the same things for 100 days, it will become a habit. So this really is just people trying to put a timeline to it. And people talk about 1,000 hours, 2,000 hours. And in Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell outlined the 10,000 10, hours, which in the literature has some been, sometimes been talked about. But I want to propose here that there is a very simple solution to this uh, timeline that people try to project, which is just to change the way in which we think about the way in which we want to like, and be involved with habits. It's just, we, we don't normally want to just uh, be engaged with a habit and then leave it. Although there are some things that we might want to do like that, for most practical purposes, we want to sustain a habit indefinitely. So the question really is, how can I sustain this habit indefinitely? Not how long will it be until I accomplish this habit? Again, for most habits, we want to sustain them indefinitely. So don't think of it, don't, um, try to put a timeline that is, you know, like not reasonable just because you want to get this done as quickly as possible and then I'll get it done. Just think of long, just think long term. And the second most quoted thing that I've seen out there is the, uh, the talk about willpower. Um, this quote probably encapsulates a little bit of the problem with it, which uh, it says that most of life's actions are within our reach, but decisions take willpower. Um, so yeah, the, the evidence shows that willpower is limited because it gets exhausted with many, many things. In the literature, it is often referred to as ego depletion and factors that deplete it basically involve almost everything that we do as the day goes on, including time in and of itself because it relates to the little stresses that occur during the day, the emotional stress, the physical stress, all of them slightly deplete our willpower and um, really create another barrier for us to engage in our behavior. So that's one problem that it is limited. And the second one is that it really is a binary and linear way of thinking about accomplishing our, our goal because it basically makes the ultimate goal to be e I either complete it or not. So instead of relying on this binary outcomes, I either complete it or not, it's better to rely on a system that's simply just like the okay now ones did and currently do as a matter of fact, just to make this habits, this positive behavioral outcomes and physiological outcome to occur, not only because it's the right thing to do, because, because, but because it is the default. So a few ways in which this two differ, we can see here that causality is different. Is different. Systems thinking addresses the fact that, they're, that in being engaged in a, in a habit is complex instead of simple. We know that outcomes from engaging in one or another particular behavior will be multiple, not just like a single one. And the fluidity in and of itself, and here's where the binary nature of the thinking linearly or binarily is problematic, is, uh, is not acknowledged. So here we either engage in it or not, whereas in a systems level thinking, we can think of our system having multiple parts that can be uh, modified 
and made and changed so that the system is more resilient. So just an example of this, because again, it is really important to understand it. Thinking linearly about this, for example, with something nutritionally would be, will be something like, here we have our willpower, we hit our willpower and our um, action of more fruits and vegetables that we want to engage in. And then we combine them and then we sit down and then now we're doing it. So it's occurring and it might feel a little good, but now we expect, you know, increase uh, pleasure from this or being more fulfilled, but we don't really think big picture about this. And then we have our social situation. Like say we were engaging in this new vegetarian diet for some reason. And we don't foresee that our friends really are not um, going to this restaurant that are really uh, friendly for this. So we can see that the social aspect is not there and the peer support is not there either. So it creates more friction. And then at the end of the day, we are back to baseline. We try to engage in a habit. We didn't really think big picture about this. We are literally right where we started. But what happens if we actually engage in a bigger picture kind of thing in systems thinking? Jonathan, can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah, go ahead. Um, we had a question from someone that says, do some people have more willpower than others? Yeah, so interestingly, this has been looked at in the literature. Like, is there, is there a genetic, for example, basis for um, this well of willpower being bigger in some people than in others? And the other question is like, can this be affected by our environment, by behavior? Can I like flex the willpower muscle? Can I um, make it bigger by just basically engaging in it? And both seem to be true. Like whenever you look at studies between like twins, you see that some people engage in habit and successfully um, complete or sustain the habit for longer, um, even in twin studies. But there are many limitations to this research. It is not, it doesn't paint a complete picture. So we don't really know. The question is maybe yes, there are the genetic, the genetic differences. But what we do know for a fact is that um, using willpower um, more frequently does seem to, for some reason, increase or uh, like increase the amount of perceived willpower that one has to exert. But again, I would emphasize that it is be it's better to have a system that leads to your outcome uh, despite of if you have the energy or not to complete it. So yes, the, the, the answer is there is some literature to say that some people might have, might have some uh, innate willpower than others, but I wouldn't have any clear definition based on literature. Does that answer and, the question? Yeah, um, and there's a couple more I wanted just to kind of, that goes along with that. And it says, um, what do you call someone that can create a new habit, but later revert back to the old habit? Um, I wouldn't know exactly the exact term for reverting back to a habit, but for most studies would just be like someone who didn't successfully sustain the habit or reverted back to, the ha to their previous habit. So no, there is no uh, one name that I know of, but yeah, just the one who reverted back to their old, ha old habits or uh, failed to adopt the new one. Right. And there's a few more, but I think I might add those at the end that kind of go along. Sounds good. Yeah, just um, you can bring them out to the end and let me know. But yeah, as I was mentioning before, if we were to actually engage in um, the big picture thinking that let's say a friend recommended, we would assess what we currently know is important for us. And let's say that we came up with this four big categories for our dietary change. We know that those are important for us and we evaluate them just like subjectively. We put some random numbers. We know that 100% is what we, um, is, is gonna add up to, but then we, we really just take an objective look at it and we know that our energy and satiety from this new diet for some reason is good, but we really can't foresee uh, keep, to keep going with this. We don't really have support from our peers with which um, additionally makes like the ease of this being, uh, of the social ease of this being harder, apart from the fact that, you know, maybe the restaurants don't really have the availability for you to accommodate your new diet. So now you're engaging with this bigger picture and then you talk to your peers so that they will support you with maybe some slight modifications to your diet. Now you want to, let's say, include cheese where before you didn't and now you can have the option of like cheese in your pizza, and 
et cetera, et cetera. Just think of like a new inclusion that you were able to make so that you can now more easily incorporate this habit, which leads literally to a more balanced approach. Now it will look a little bit more like this, which ideally will lead to a better satisfaction with your, with your new habit and ideally will help you to sustain it long-term. So now after um, giving some reference for a few things, I wanna jump into the practical application of um, habits into nutrition. So here is, it is actually interesting to go back to the original definition of diet because it was framed to initially as a way of life. So dieta, uh, which is the Latin for diet, literally means a way of life. But unfortunately, most people implicitly understand this to be an on and off thing and they associate it with terms like restriction, um, less ability to consume foods that I like, et cetera, et cetera. And ultimately, it has been shown in the literature to lead to what I want to just call colloquially the what the hell effect. So here we look at the picture. It really encapsulates really well what happens with us would say, just imagine this is you and a pizza, but I'm just going to go with the dog for now. So you, you're the dog or the person with the pizza. And you're just saying, oh, it's good to be home and relaxing. Finally, I was so tired. And, uh, but you know that the owner is going to come back and engage with, um, yeah. you know, this pillow. They will just sit on the pillow. But you like really like you. Now that you are not a And, uh, um, yeah, so you fall asleep. You don't really think about it. You think it's going to be fine. But, whoops, you eat a slice of pizza or as the dog did, uh, bites the pillow. And then they just go, what the hell? I already like ate a piece of it. Might as well just consume the whole thing and they blow it. But obviously you don't think I have to think about this hard to know that this at the end of the day uh, is not necessary. You did not have to, for example, consume the, the whole pizza or you didn't have to eat the entire um, pillow. If you would have eaten one bite, it would have been still better. But again, it's not the fact that um, we think rational, rationally about this. We're literally just going where our gut instincts about what we think is going to work, which is like to hold on to really restrain from our behavior. But ultimately it sort of creates this um, friction that builds and builds and builds and builds. And ultimately you just feel like you can't resist it and you just binge or whatever it is that ends up happening with your undesired behavior. So based on this, I think the old adage really came about. Um, which has many, many people saying like, it's not a diet, it's a lifestyle, which actually refers to some systems thinking. A good way to think about this to me um, was said by Sohi Lee. Uh, it says that if you can't see yourself sticking to your diet one year from now, you need to rethink your strategy. If you don't like the way you eat, you won't stick it for long. And it'll only be a matter of time before you jump ship and end up regaining, at least in this, um, she was talking about weight, but really it, is, it, it comes about with any one change that we want to have regarding diet is like if you want to you know just have more freedom in your diet and you want it to be more flexible and that's your goal you're just gonna you're just gonna end up a baseline so it is better to think of it in terms of a system and think it of it in terms of a system really um it it is to engage with four different strategies that have been again repeatedly shown in the literature to be to help with sustainability the first thing is sustainability as an item in and of itself, because to think about this helps you to frame how, what you're going to put in your diet, what you're going to avoid, et cetera, because there is no diet like the one that you're going to end up adhering long-term to. Because people, again, like if you are a, a, a clinician, if you are someone working in the trenches, or even if you're just someone trying to engage in a new diet, you're trying to think of the superior, superiority of the diet in and of itself, like it's better for metabolic health, for X, Y, and Z. But the real question is, can you adhere to the diet long-term? If not, just rethink your strategy. And the second one actually addresses the question of willpower or the, the issue of willpower, because many people think that they have to be motivated enough in order to engage with their habit. But again, if you think systems, if you just think of the things that help you to make the right decisions, even when you don't want to, you would think of your environment. You would think of 
I get home and what's there, what's on the counter, what's right, what's right there available when I come home from work, either tired or with enough energy. So just make it easy to engage in the right behaviors. Put the, the things that you want to consume visible and the things that you don't want to consume invisible. So don't bring them home or maybe just put them in a, you know, in a cabinet, moderate, abs just be abstinent if you want, just you gauge your own um, level of restriction, I guess you have to incorporate, but just be accountable for how your environment is helping to shape your behaviors. The third strategy is a level of engaging in some level of cognitive restraint, which is to say that you want to have some accountability. You want to have a, a body to help you to engage in um, your new habit. So that's actually why many times any type of system helps with sustainability long-term than the diets, I guess, that don't have a system for accountability. For so, so if you have like a points, um, points, in, points in your diet, like the, I think it's, uh, I actually don't remember the name of it about right now, but yeah, there are many systems that just involve some restraint. Like you have points that you count, you have a partner, you have a coach, you have a dietitian, you have someone who you are accountable to. And this is the main, one of the main things to think about. So again, it's not the name of the diet that will determine the success of it, but mostly like is the accountability that I am going to engage in sustainable for me long-term? Am I willing to do this? But make sure that you have something there to not just be like, I hope that now that I'm engaging in this, it will just happen in and of it by itself. Have something to keep you accountable. And the last um, piece to put together here is gonna be to not rush into the process to really go slow into it because one of the main things that comes up in the literature is the, um, the speed at which people engage in, it is often referred to as um, just like unsustainable weight loss because people really try to go into what many people know as a crash diet and they do lose a lot of weight. So again, in the problem in America, for example, it's not really that we have a weight loss problem because people can't lose weight, people lose weight. And now I'm just going with the weight loss example here, but um, yeah, we don't really have a problem with weight loss because people do lose the weight. It's just that they can't keep it up. So a strategy here would be to incorporate things slowly. It gives you time to think about it. It gives you think. Uh, it gives you time to reevaluate if something is not going well. So again, engaging in sustainable behavior, choosing the right food environment, engaging in some sort of cognitive restraint or accountability system, and taking it slow in order for it to I guess go well. And I want to shift gears into exercise. And I want to make a, a note on the fact that actually most of the things that I'm going to be talking about carry over to the next uh, segment. But the literature for some reason um, finds this particular um, items that I'm going to be talking about particularly successful. But in general, they sh each one of them you will uh, notice are effective in each one of the areas. So sustainability works for each one of the habits that you want to engage in. Either it's exercise, nutrition, meditation, water, anything. It doesn't matter. It, they should matter because they are inevitably part of the things that are going to determine your success. But here I want to just, again, jump into exercise and re-emphasize to not yo-yo, to just not have one program in which you engage in and then jump jump before you even have time to evaluate into another. Um, also regarding exercise to not think that you can just exercise your diet away. So not to think that you can just eat all the pizzas possible, but if you just exercise quite enough, you will be able to outweigh the, you know, the, the down, the negative effects of your diet. And lastly, again, to reemphasize that you need to find something you can adhere to. And nothing makes the point better than the study looking at the, um, the, big, the, the show, The Biggest Loser. So people that went to The Biggest Loser, as we know, we, they engaged in a really strict nutritional and exercise regimen. And true, as I mentioned before, they did lose weight. So if we look here in this graph, here we have their body weight change. And by the end of the 30 weeks, I believe was The Biggest Loser, most people ended up on a, either a slight weight loss or actually like a significant weight loss or a huge weight loss. But looking at their sustainability upon six years of um, their diet and their exercise, like coming back to baseline because they were just simply unsustainable, weight came back up, 
um, just because of the physiological way that things go, fat-free mass, um, like, you know, lean mass went up a little bit, but notably their fat mass went up like crazy. So just as, as compared to their um, baseline. So they chose as their goal that they wanted to lose weight. And as I mentioned before, came right back to baseline. It is not the point. So let's just not do this. But, Jonathan, okay. yeah. Jonathan, I have a question for you. Yeah. What do you do when you have incorporated good changes, consistent exercise, nutrition, food, tracking, but weight does not change? How does one stay motivated? I try to consider other rewards such as how I feel, but it is difficult to stay motivated, sometimes easy to get what the hell attitude. Um, this person's in their 50s and weight loss is so much slower than it used to be. Any suggestions? Right. Um, yeah, so one of the main things to consider here is the fact that, um, as this person mentioned, weight loss shouldn't be the sole go uh, goal of engaging in diet. Diet really provides a number of benefits and weight loss, weight loss just happens to be one of them. But if for some reason the person does decide to, you know, lose some weight and they are not getting their goal, obviously here I would just refer to just go and seek the help of a professional. Um, one of the main things that happens regarding uh, weight loss as a goal and people not seeing the results is not really being in a caloric deficit. So people think that because they're engaging in their behavior and they're successfully um, repeating it, they think that now weight loss should just be a thing that comes with. But many times you are getting many, many benefits, but weight loss doesn't happen to be one of them. So there, the specific part of the equation that might go, um, not be going as intended might be the caloric deficit end of itself. So at that point, if you really don't know what to do to troubleshoot properly, I would just seek the help of a professional to do it appropriately to maybe just slightly decrease um, calories in a way that is sustainable. And again, I mentioned the help of a dietitian just because Many times we reduce calories in a not sustainable way. We reduce like just portions, which is the most common way of doing it. But uh, just an example, one of the things that uh, a professional would suggest would be to just eat foods that provide the same amount of satiety, but um, at the end of the day, you don't really feel the effect of the calorie of the uh, calorie reduction. So yeah, that's just one strategy to engage in. I would suggest regarding like weight loss, uh, if you're really having difficulty with it, um, just talk to a professional. But yeah, that would be the, I would think, uh, one way to think about it. To really uh, think about all the benefits the diet is providing and with regards to weight loss, to think of that part of the equation. Okay, so that being said, I want to jump into what we should actually do regarding exercise that would most, uh, that would like make the habit change most effective. Uh, but first, I really just want to talk about the way in which many people just set the rec like the, the goals for exercise. Uh, and this really was me when I was younger, honestly. I would go to New Year's. I was definitely a New Year's uh, person when I was younger. And I would say, okay, now I'm going to do it. This is the pole vault approach, meaning I'm going to go as high as possible. I'm going to reach for the sky five days a week cardio, yoga, everything under the sun, I'm gonna do it at all. And I got all the injuries you can think of. I fell on my face first so many times, it was crazy. And it took me just a long time to then come to this approach. This is just basically the, all right, let me just realistically start with two to three days a week, I think is a good starting point. And this just goes to the first point. It talks about lowering the threshold because engaging with something that you can um, successfully accomplish in and of itself is intrinsically pleasurable. So you just lower the threshold of what you think you, should, you can do so that you for sure can hit it, um, you will then be able to accomplish it more easily and then you'll be, you feel motivated to keep going. Um, and Tessa, if you could do me a favor, I think there is some drawing here. If you could just restrict the ability to draw, um, that'd be great. Um, but yeah, so here, one way to think about it is using SMART goals. I believe this stands for specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time bound. You can definitely look this up, but it's just, it's just one way to think about how to set up your goals so that you're properly lowering the threshold. 
Again, if you make it specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time bound, you will say that, um, again, going for five days of everything you can think of under the sun is just not realistic. You really are not setting a proper goal. You're like, hope it happens at some point during the, this year. Attainable, not really. Measurable, hopefully in one way or another you're writing it down, probably not if you haven't really like thought about this through. And specific, maybe, maybe not. Again, it's just one way to think about it, but just lowering the threshold is uh, essential at the beginning so that you can see yourself really getting there. Second, it would be to really uh, emphasize the need for community support in order for you to accomplish your goal. We are intricate, intricately connected. Oh my God. Um, and uh, here we know that we are going to have to rely on people. Like we have our family. If we don't have our family, we have our friends. If we don't have our friends, we have our colleague, our colleagues. We have multiple people that we rely upon to do multiple things and uh, involving, getting involved in exercise is not, it, it doesn't like fall outside of this realm. So finding a workout buddy, finding a coach, finding an app, finding something again that, as I mentioned before, holds you accountable and provides that little push that you need in order to keep going the next day um, helps. So how, knowing, for example, for me, that my friend was waiting for me, my friend Richie and I would go and there was this, um, a place where we would go run in the morning, he was waiting for me. So I knew that if I didn't go, I was gonna let him down. So I would, even if it was five in the morning, I would just get up and go. Not that you have to get up at five in the morning, but it just makes the point for us. You are setting yourself up for success if you do it this way. And lastly, it is that, it's important to remark that reducing friction between the start of your habit and the actual um, engagement in the habit is very important. So say that you're trying to, you know, start this running habit, but you really can't get to it. So think of the things that you need to do in order for you to start. You know that you need to have your clothes on because you're probably not going to go in your, in your work clothes. So say that you go to sleep and you want to go and you, now you have this goal that is specific, it's measurable, it's all this stuff. And the um, time bound and measurable part involves you doing it in the morning uh, for 30 minutes, meaning that you now want to go to bed with your clothes on. Now it's easier to start because you don't have to really put your clothes on, they're, they're on. Or for example, just put your shoes right by your bed. Now you're modifying your environment and now you have a cue as soon as you wake up to remember that you have to go run. So this just makes the point, just the easier you make it for you to start your habit, the easier it is for you to repeat it and for you to specifically like start it which is again, what many people say it's one of their main limitations, just starting the actual habit. Once they get going, they can keep going, but starting it is one of the main problems. And now I'm gonna change gears to the last topic in this presentation, which is um, meditation. Um, I just wanna make the note here, I am not a meditation teacher. Um, I know that that's not like necessarily a specific credential that I know of as of now, but people that have engaged in meditation for a long time really are teachers with 30, 40 years of practice, sometimes less, sometimes more, but with, they have engaged with this practice for a long, long time. Here, I am just one who has engaged with this habit successfully. I have done it for four years now. I have gone to several meditation retreats. So I can speak from a first person perspective of what it is like to go through all the limitations, all the barriers that keep you from meditating and to adapt it successfully. So just to start off, I um, wanna talk about like what people talk about when they talk about engaging the project of meditating. This, is, this person here is my favorite meditation teacher and this is his teacher. And when he was starting, he was really reluctant to start and he was really just like, I don't know what this is about. It just seems like has a lot of religious background to it and I'm not into that. But his teacher just said, okay, you just seem like you're in distress and you seem like you don't understand your mind, but you want to. So if you just want to understand your mind, sit down and observe it. And as a matter of fact, apparently this gained traction. He helped, uh, Joseph Goldstein helped to bring this practice to the, to the West. And as you can see down here, many apps have also taken the task to popularize this practice, which now we now know has many, many, many benefits. So just briefly talking about the benefits or um, I want to go into the opposite side, like talking about what it is that this practice is helping you to accomplish, what problem is getting solved here. Um, one of the main things that gets talked about is that we, we think continuously 
without knowing that we are thinking. You might have heard someone say that, that someone that meditates say that. But specifically in the literature, actually there's the psychologist in the 80s, Thomas uh, Vorkovec, talked about this process of, of behavior change and how part, one of the cues can actually be a negative emotion and how many of the uh, mental habits that we engage in are actually a routine. So I'm gonna give an example here, for example. We have this cue. Let's, it's a pandemic, so we have news coming, like all kind of bad news coming from any source that we wanna get, like the internet, our phones, the computer, it doesn't matter. And there might be, they might evoke many like unpleasant memories about you know the past, the future. And you might be engaging in this process repeatedly, thinking about the past, thinking about the future, thinking about the past, thinking about the future. And now you don't really notice it, but you are feeling that all those negative emotions, which are cueing a routine, which is to engage in anxiety and worry and anger. And at the end of the day, we may end up doing something about it. So we either distract ourselves, we grab our phones, we go talk to someone, we just look away, uh, we distract ourselves, we try to regain control, we try to do something about it. And at the end of the day, we end up just reinforcing this cycle. But I want to talk about specifically what is introduced here upon engaging in meditation. So once we engage in the process of learning how to meditate, which is surprisingly easy to start, we don't know exactly why this happens. We don't know precisely what mechanism gets activated. But the first person perspective, the feeling of having this tool available feels like a bell that gets rung whenever we engage in this, when we notice these uh, negative emotions that are associated with these cues with that uh, come with the news, cueing you know, anxiety or worry or this past um, and future uh, planning uh, presents, instead of us going immediately into a routine of anxiety or worry, for some reason, again, we don't know exact, the exact mechanisms, this bell gets rung. And now we don't really engage in this. This gets interestingly replaced so from what would have been a negative emotion and then immediately worry, what we feel here is relief and what we feel here, the reward many times is either concentration or relief in and of itself um, being the reward. So again, the process in and of itself, we don't completely understand it, but what we do feel as a first person perspective is that we now have a bell that now it's installed and now we have it and we really can't Make it go. We can obviously ignore that we have the bell, but the bell is there. Jonathan, yes. there's a question out there. Are there any studies about fibromyalgia or chronic disease or illness and engagement in diet and exercise? Yes, yes, there, there are. Um, but the problem is that I don't know if any high quality, like systematic reviews, meaning like high big picture studies, uh, making any conclusive evidence about pain being um, completely mitigated by any given supplement or dietary strategy, but there are um, a number of um, bioactive compounds that have been talked about um, regarding um, diet that can help to mitigate general pain, and they include fibromyalgia. So some of them have been, um, from what I understand, curcumin. Um, so a specific doses of curcumin, I believe is how it's uh pronounced and um other adaptogens have been looked at but no there is no solid evidence to say that they will completely eliminate your pain but there is some suggestive evidence to say that they might help to modulate pain and then i have another one how do you initiate and maintain a behavior change when your family members are engaging in op opposite behaviors for example, you're trying to eat more fruits and vegetables while your children, spouse, eat tons of junk food. Yeah, I, I was actually thinking about uh, including a slide regarding like inclusion of habits and the, um, the family environment because yes, as this person mentioned, it really is uh, hard to engage in a behavior whenever like people are opposing it. But here the main thing that I cannot emphasize enough is to communicate with whoever it is that you're going to be, that is going to be seeing you engage in this habit or is having, is going to have to support you uh, with the sustainability of this habit. 
because again, we are interconnected. We have to get people that, ma that matter to us to be on our same page. So yeah, the idea for you to engage in your habit is to talk with the people that matter most to you that are gonna help you to be engaged in this habit and make sure that they agree and that they um, see this plan be something that they can, that you all can do as a group. They don't have, for example, you're a vegan or vegetarian or engage in some other type of diet, they, your spouse, your children, they don't have to do it, but they have to support you and they have to be okay with the fact that you're gonna continually in, uh, be engaged in this. And then you had referenced bell before, and could you review what you meant or you mean by that? Yeah, I'm just gonna go back really quick with this slide. Yeah, by the introduction of a bell, I meant to say that um, the process of meditating introduce makes this um feelings associated with the oh sorry i'm just going yeah what i meant to say was that the the process of meditating makes the feelings associated um with the contemplation of this horrible news or with the engagement in this past or future kind of planning upon meditating it for some reason becomes more noticeable it says it's, instead of someone whispering in the back someone was yelling at you, like you are feeling bad, 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 bad. Just notice it. Not like necessarily engage with it, but just notice it. That's, what's get, that's what gets taught upon meditating. But the bell just refers to the increasing noticeable feeling of the sensations coming on. So hopefully that <laughs> answers the question. Okay. So I wanted to now talk about some of the promising um, ways in which now we have been able to look at mindfulness. Uh, because nowadays, uh, many clinicians, many psychiatrists specifically, have looked at um, behavior change and mindfulness specifically to mitigate problems with um, disorder eating. I wanted to actually say disorder eating there, not eating disorders, but yeah, disorder eating, substance abuse, including nicotine addiction. Just to give, give an example here, um, a recent program uh, was able to see effects of five times the effectiveness of the gold standard treatment, which is um, commonly in uh, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, for nicotine uh, remission. And mindfulness, a, man, a mindfulness based approach was five times as effective. And also pain regulation. So, yeah, this includes just chronic pain, chronic back pain. Um, I believe there have been studies in fibromyalgia, but uh, don't call me on that. But yeah, there, there has been subs a substantial amount of literature mounting um, in support of mindfulness helping with pain regulation because it doesn't necessarily make the pain go away. It just helps with the process of uh, noticing that you're engaging in mental pain and not just physical pain. And interestingly, that is something that, um, at least from the first, first person perspective, has been anecdotally reported to be able to be decoupled. So people can engage in pain, in physical pain, and not necessarily just re-engage with the thought of, oh my God, that hurts so much, um, by simply and clearly feeling the, the pain in and of itself. And I can definitely attest to this. I, when I was in my meditation retreats, there are moments in which you've been sitting for eight hours and it just hurts. Um, you have to just stand up. But for some reason, you don't feel the extensive pain, like, oh my God, this has hurt for several hours. So yeah, it, the literature is just mounting and mounting for the benefits of uh, mindfulness meditation. But regarding how to apply this specifically, as I mentioned before, all carries, everything that I've said before carries over to this, the importance of each one of the things. But now there are some little barriers that you might encounter in mindful, like trying to engage with mindfulness meditation that you might not engage in. Um, in, that you might not see in exercise and nutrition. So although you might want to start slow, I just want to start here, you might want to start slow, like just like you would do with um, nutrition and exercise change. Um, you do want to set a time of, for example, like five to 10 minutes, if that seems doable to start off, because this uh, mindfulness has really suffered from uh, unrealistic timelines, people just trying to meditate for I don't know, 30, 40 minutes, and they have no idea how to engage in pain. And unfortunately, if you are someone that has had um, past trauma or something of the sort, you might have uh, feelings that you don't know necessarily how to deal with. 
and being engaged with them for a, like really prolonged periods of time can be distressing and really traumatizing. So again, starting slow here is even more important to emphasize. And again, progress here is going to be nonlinear. It's going to be the feeling of us going down, up, up, down, because now we're, we can see that we're thinking more and more and more. Uh, it's going to be felt more. So it feels like we're going down, but then you are going to notice that you can deal with it better. So now the feeling goes up in terms of your acquisition of the skill. Here, the choosing the right practice is really important. So if either you want to engage in concentration because you feel like you lack that, open awareness, training your compassion muscles, et cetera, et cetera, is really important. And lastly, engaging with an app here is going to be very useful. Having a guiding teacher can be very, very helpful. Jonathan, somebody asked, what is compassion training? Yeah, um, this is really not something that I knew either what it was when I first engaged in it, but it's also called meta or loving kindness training. But it refers to the process of repeating phrases that you can easily um, engage with. So if you, or not even repeating phrases, as long as you can engage with the feeling of, for example, love and friendliness and um, amicab amicability and all this good feelings of uh, well-wishing, and you can repeat it towards a friend, yourself, a neutral person and something who you have complications with, that is training and compassion. That is like essentially tr what people in the meditation world call training and compassion. You're actually literally trying to make that the default. That when you think about someone else, you're thinking of them in a well-wishing, um, like in good terms, essentially, even with difficult people. And here I just wanted to give some conclusions and reiterate the importance of each one of um, the factors that are key for each one of the topics that we touch on. So here for nutrition, again, we talked about sustainability uh, being a key factor for you to engage in your behavior long-term, food environment being important so that the right thing to do is the default thing to do, to hold yourself accountable in one way or another, to have a friend, to have a system, to have a nap, to have one way or another to do it, and to engage in it in a way that you can reevaluate. So do it slowly. Exercise, make sure to incorporate some system that helps you um, to understand your goals realistically. So again, I mentioned lowering the threshold, but setting your goals in a like specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-bound way, it, it makes your goal bound to succeed. Having support from your peers, Again, in all this area, this applies to all the areas, but here, you know, it is going to be essential for you to have the approval of your friends and the people that are in your life that, um, that want you to succeed to have your support. And lastly, we want to reduce the friction between you starting your habit and you engaging, in, like starting and uh, continuing your habit. And lastly, meditating. As I mentioned before, it's important for each one of these, but starting slow, again, here is gonna be very, very important knowing that because now things are going to come up in your head in a more unpronounced way and it's important to know that progress is not going to be non-linear you're going to start meditating you're going to feel like you're thinking non-stop but that's good because now you know that you're thinking now the progress or the process itself is not going subconsciously it is important to choose the right practice to know what your main um cognitive uh toolkit is lacking uh, the most so if you lack concentration you're getting constantly distracted you might want to engage in that if you find yourself just talking repeatedly like in bad terms about someone else, you want to engage in compassion training or simply uh, some other kind of training because they're just saying I, I'm meditating. It's like saying I'm engaging in sports. There are just too many and each one of them has a different benefit. And last thing is to find a teacher to find an app because this is just really going to maximize your ability to know what the terrain is going to look like, to know what, how you can overcome a barrier this person or this app that you're gonna have is now gonna be, uh, is gonna really help you to succeed in your habit. Jonathan, do yes. the long-term results of meditation depend on the amount of time per day? Yeah, that is something that is being looked at increasingly. And yes, there seems to be like a threshold, but that threshold hasn't been clearly established because um, we have seen in studies that as low as 10 to 20 minutes can be, um, very successful for the uh, change in even um, neural processes that can be visible at the neural level uh, to be detectable. So there are significant changes that can happen with five to 10 minutes, but there seems to be a dose dependence 
So people that have, for example, engaged with 30 to 40 minutes per day and now can su successfully do it and do it more frequently do seem to, get, um, to draw more benefit from it. But for the purpose of like first just engaging with it, I want to remark that it's important to start um, with an amount of time that you know you can commit to so that you can later, if you want to, and you feel like you can, then engage in those 30, 40 minutes if you really want to get to that. And here is something that, again, it's, it's provided in the handout, but it's just a way for you to think of how to put this all into practice. But you have you, your goal, you want to incorporate, you choose one. This is very specific, very realistic. You want to eat more veggies, you want to walk, meditate. And again, this is, a, I'm going to give credit to my girlfriend. She made this and she helped me to think about this. Um, but yeah, jumping into accountability, then you choose one thing to be accountable, one or two things. You go into the uh, slow incorporation of it. You're engaging with it one, two times a week. And then lastly, you are reevaluating and then reiterating the process again and again to make it more refined and to make it um, more doable. And just some resources here, just to make this uh, talk as practical as possible. We have a book and an app for each one of the topics that I talked on for nutrition, exercise, and meditation. And I wanted to put out there um, two resources for behavior change in general. This is a topic that is covered broadly in the literature and in books and lay books. Um, and these are two resources I really encourage you to look. And um, I'm just wanna, I just wanna put a plug here. We have a next week, um, Ask the Experts, the Health Disparities and COVID-19 is gonna be talked about um, in the, in the Zoom webinar next Thursday, July 16th from 12 to one. So I encourage everyone to attend. This topic is obviously hard pressing on every one of us, so yeah. And definitely wanna encourage everyone to attend next week's talk, which is gonna be on genetics, nutrition, and the brain. It's gonna be by um, Mikhail Key. And um, yeah, now I'm ready to take any questions that we have some time. I know we took some questions in the meanwhile, but um, yeah, and I just want to say, you know, we really do appreciate your feedback. Um, it is valuable to us, and we would love to hear from you about the topic, what topics you'd like to learn more about. I even got the person in the chat that they would like to hear this one with a little bit longer time. So I'll draw your attention to the online survey and we put in the chat box, but we will take a little bit more time for those of you who want to stay on just to ask a few more questions. Jonathan, there was one earlier, and I know you kind of alluded to it, but does motivation and willpower work together or are they different concepts? Um, yeah, so they often get talked about interchange interchangeably um, in the literature and sometimes they don't, but um, motivation many times involves the, the incorporation of systems so that the push that you feel to like engage in your habit is strong. So if you consider what is pushing you behind, like if you were to think of like, you know, you starting your habit and things pushing you from behind for you to start that habit, one of the things to think of is willpower pushing you to be more motivated. So in the literature, that is one of the ways that it gets talked about differentially, if that makes sense. Yes, and then we had another one. Um, was there a beginner book um, that you would recommend for starting meditation? Yeah. And what resources to introduce to children? Do you have anything to recommend for that? Yeah, um, so this book right here is the one that I would honestly recommend to most people. It's uh, for, to start off at the very least. So if you are um, just thinking about engaging in this habit and you don't really know where to start, you don't really know what this is about, this is a really, really good book to read or to listen to, 10% Happier by Dan Harris. Um, and then this app, oh, whoops. And then this app, I believe has um, meditations for children. And, and so does this app right here. This book is an app as well, but this app, Waking Up, has medita meditations for children, I believe as low as I think four to six years old. So impressively, this um, has been incorporated even in schools with very, very early ages. And I recommend these two apps primarily for, again, starting off meditation, 10% uh, happier. And for children, both are very useful. The 10% happier happen waking up. 
Was there any other questions that somebody had for Jonathan? So how do you sustain stopping a bad habit? I find it easier to do things you're supposed to as opposed to stopping negative habits. Yeah, I would recommend uh, reading this book for that specifically, because if you, if everyone noticed here, I talk mostly about the initiation of a habit, but if you would want to stop a bad habit, what I would suggest and what this book that I'm recommending uh, suggests is to reverse the process. So if you are trying to make something, for example, have m uh, less friction for you to be able to engage in it, just in try to revert the process and increase the friction. So now what was, for example, easily at reach um, at your countertop, now it's not even at home, you didn't buy it, or it's in a cabinet and locked away, you barely remember where it is. Or for example, if you want to um, make something, like just along with food environment, like if you something was visible, now make it invisible, along with the um, example of reducing friction. But yeah, to go into more detail, I would definitely suggest uh, reverting the process of making things more easy. Um, and I would refer to this book of Atomic Habits in which the process of stopping bad habits gets talked about a lot too. Great. Any other questions? Sorry. Um, somebody would like you to show the slide created by your girlfriend again. <laughs> Got it. Yep. Props to her. This is going to be in the handout as well, but uh, this slide is really good because it really just outlines the engagement and a habit and how you go through it in each step. It's a little bit different from the SMART goal, uh, SMART goals approach, but it still very much uh, encapsulates what the SMART goals tries to apply and even less steps in my opinion. So even probably more uh, easily to visualize. Jonathan, um, an individual asked if there was a way to contact you direct if they had additional questions. Um, yeah, I wouldn't mind anyone to shoot me um, an email to be completely honest. So um, would it be okay if I just put my email in the- or Chat you, box, yeah. yes. Yeah, everyone feel free to contact me if you have any specific questions. Again, this word applied, um, applied to different topics, but yeah, there are different topics that have been looked at in the literature in of themselves, and there are other specific approaches that have been talked about for those specific habits. So if you have questions about this or other habits, just feel free to contact me. Great. Well, last call for any other questions and we're gonna kind of go ahead and log off.